Yeah. I, I'm a newbie here. My name is Asaf Christopher, so I was thinking to make my own introduction. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure. Okay, and um, so this is the title of my talk. But I would like to start from 1997. And uh, you can see this is me here. And I'm working in, in, uh, as a plant breeder affiliated with the, with the seed company. And I had the, the fortune of working with the Zinc Archie, which is uh, one of the famous uh, melon breeder in, uh, in Israel. Uh, we uh, developed the Galia melon. You know, you heard the name Galia? Galia is the name of his daughter. And he developed this whole brand of uh, sweet uh, melon bird. And uh, it's, uh, the income for the state of Israel was millions out of uh, hybrid seeds. Back then it was all government. So he was uh, renowned for that, and I had the, the opportunity to work with the, to be the last uh, employee of Sleep Archie before he passed away, fortunately. Um, usually when I, was, when I say that I was a, a melon breeder, people are laughing, you know, kind of, uh, what do you need melon breeders for? But of course you need that. And uh, I wasn't only a melon breeder, I was also a watermelon breeder. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and we developed, after three years, you see this is the time block, after three years we developed a personal watermelon. And this is, a, I think, is a great invention because you have a small watermelon, seedless of course, uh, sweet, you cannot tell, the taste is perfect. And it's portable, you can put it in your refrigerator, you don't have to carry big watermelon with you. And, uh, well, price was, was good. And above all, um, the year 2000 and the top Things, um, singles were uh, born to make you happy. Oops, I did it again and lucky. So I thought I could live like that forever. <laughs> but uh, then came 2001, so I had a very short uh, time where we had the competitors developing their own seedless watermelon. And it was perfect too. No seeds. Sweet, small, but you see it has a different skin. We have, I think, nicer dark skin, but this one has these uh, stripes. So, what happened with that is very unfortunate because this uh, seedless watermelon took, took on the market. And I know I find myself, myself uh, unemployed because Every, all, all the farmers wanted to uh, grow this watermelon because they got higher prices for that. And, of course, ironically, <laughs> yeah, so I, I recognize that the stars are not there for me with the watermelon uh, field. And then I, I devoted myself the next uh, eight or so years for uh, studying wheat. This is me, by the way. Um, studying uh, wheat, and I started to look at uh, wild animal wheat, <coughs> and starting playing with the uh, uh, crosses between wild animal wheat and uh, domesticated wheat. And by, uh, I finished my PhD, started uh, postdoc, uh, postgraduate studies at uh, UC Davis, at George Dukowski's lab, and by the year 2010, until now, I have my, my own lab in Tel Aviv University. This is not Tel Aviv University, we, we do have buildings there. <laughs> but, but we like to go out, outdoors. And usually when some say that I look younger and when I come for conferences, people mistake me as a student. Well, usually it's a good thing, but not if you are a professor. And but here it's a special conference because yesterday I was uh, asked if I am the, the winemaker. Oh. And it's much better, actually. 
Yeah, I think I will add this to, to the title. By the way, I have no idea why I was... why this uh, very nice lady thought I'm the one maker. But it happened, so... Alright. Ursula, where are you? Okay. Yeah, this is for you. So, enough introduction, let's go, let's be serious and talk about uh, wheat. So, we heard here quite a lot that wheat supplies 20% of the calories consumed by humanity. And this is really uh, something that is amazing. And also, from an evolutionary point of view, you, you can, it's, it's also amazing that all came from the fertile crescent, which is somewhere here. So, there is a lot to study how uh, it evolved that way, because this is evolution, right? And if we talk about evolution, well, we have, and we are in Oxford, we have to mention, of course, uh, Charles Darwin. And he wrote that it, it is a remarkable fact that botanists, botanists are not agreed on the aboriginal parent form of any one serial of them. And, um, yeah, well, of course, um, Knowing botanists as I do, I think it's not remo remarkable. They, they don't agree on anything. <laughs> but but uh, back then, it was uh, it was a really real mystery where all the original forms or the what we call now progenitors of of the domesticated plant have disappeared. Gradually, they were identified. I mean, uh, scientists identified wild, wild barley as the progenitor of uh, domesticated barley. But wheat remained a mystery for a long time. Uh, we know from this uh, Egyptian uh, wall painting from about 3,000 years ago, we know that what was around was domesticated wheat. And how do we know that? You can see very clearly here the whole life cycle of, uh, of wheat uh, growing. And you can see here that the wheat spikes are uh, intact during harvest. <coughs> and wild plant cannot afford to be, to, to be like that. One plant, wild plant needs to distribute its seeds. Because if all the seeds will stay in the spike, all the seeds will stay in the spike that's in the spike. When they fall down and germinate, they will all be competing with one another. So one plant needs to disperse its uh, seed. And in the case of wheat, it was assumed that the dispersal unit is the spikelet. But it wasn't found until the year uh, 1906, when Aaron Aronson, who was the brilliant uh, botanist, discovered wild leather wheat in, uh, in Roshpina in Israel. Um, so since then, since this discovery, by the time this discovery was, was a big deal back then. And, uh, well, I, I'm not going to tell the story about Aaron Aronson, but there are a lot of stories involved with, with this man. Just to say that he, this uh, discovery, at the end, he, um, he had the chance to meet the President of the United States. Well, I don't know if it's uh, such a pleasure today, but back then it was, you know, you know, I have to go back to Israel, so. Um, I think it was like the, the first, uh, let's say, Israeli that, that met the president, so, okay, let's move on. Uh, since then, scientists have identified the evolution of wheat. And this ensured the, the, the evolution and I'm not going to go into too many details, but just to say that this is wild leather wheat, what Aronson discovered. And it was domesticated into what we call today Emmer and Durum. We use Durum for, for pasta. It was in the agriculture field about 8,000 years ago. It was hybridized with another goat grass. You can see here with the contributor of the D, D genome. And together, the D genome, the A and B from wild Emmer, we had, we, we had uh, um, formed the hexaploid wheat, which is the bread wheat. This is 90% of the wheat grown in the world is bread wheat. So you can see that wild Emmer wheat is the direct progenitor of 
most importantly uh, with genotypes. There are also deep, in parallel there is also diploid grid, but I'm not going to go into that. This is the older, most of the economic color, uh, interest is in, in those two varieties, Durum and Bradwick. So in my lab, when I started in 2010, I decided that I will um, study the differences that we have between uh, wild and wheat. You can see here wild and wheat and domesticated wheat. You can also see here, you notice probably that the grain size is different. This is wild wheat from Turkey, and this is wild wheat from Zabitan. Zabitan is a nature reserve in, uh, at the north of Israel. I will show you soon on the map. Uh, so you can see that what is, what is genetic variation because we grew those two um, genotypes, what we call those two varieties. If it's a, if it's a wild uh, variety, we call it accession. So we, we grew those two accession at a common garden condition and you can see the, the differences in grain size and this is because of genetic uh, elements. And as a scientist, as a geneticist, I'm really interested to identify the, the genetic mechanisms, meaning the genes that are responsible for those differences. And also, I want to uh, find out what are the genes that are responsible for the differences between wild and wheat and, and, and uh, domesticated wheat. Okay. And also you can see here that uh, if we look at durum wheat that were cultivated in the 50s and modern, modern durum wheat like Svevo, that was uh, bred by Barilla and was an uh, elite variety back at, the, at 2000, uh, we can see that the variation is not that big. And this is an indication of, of um, how selection works and how, the, uh, how reduction in genetic diversity looks like. So here we have wide uh, genetic diversity in grain size and also in other traits, and here we have narrow genetic diversity, and the uh, expression of that is what we call the phenotype. The phenotype is what we can measure. Whatever we can measure, we call it phenotype. In this case, I'm focusing on grain size. Um, so the Vitan, it's the nature reserve that it can be found uh, north to the Sea of Galilee. This is the, uh, the Golan Heights. And here we, we collected uh, uh, the Vitan accession and also other, back, uh, other accession. Uh, this is me, you can see, recognized by, by the head there. <laughs> and um, we developed a... Uh, uh, we developed a mapping population. I have a beautiful picture that I don't know why it's not there. Uh, I hope it's uh, not a trend that continues. Yeah, I think that I lost the pictures. Okay, I have to, to improvise and tell you what's the, um, what you should see here. Uh, it's the, uh, the result of a cross between wild animal wheat and domesticated wheat. And there are, should be here spikes with, uh, that vary in size, in color, and in the most, import, most uh, important or the most um, obvious trait that differentiates wild yellow wheat and domesticated wheat, which is the rachis brittleness or the spike, what, what we can call also spike shattering. I, thought I showed you in the Egyptian uh, wall paint, the spikes of uh, domesticated wheat are not shattered, but the spikes of uh, domesticated wheat are, are shattered. So I, I'll just go back because uh, you can see here we, we, we have uh, we, we see a very short spike and this is because most of the spike is already being dispersed and uh, this is a trait that is differentiated between wild accession and uh, domesticated genotypes and when Aaron Aronson found wild ever wheat he saw that it's, uh, it, it has a shattered spike and immediately knew that he found uh, the wild, uh, wild material. Now, uh, I, want to, I wanted to switch into genomics, but the presentation is not working well, so uh, let me just say that if we want to, uh, like I was saying in the beginning, we want to identify the genes that are responsible for those traits, like the brittle, 
graphics or we should we uh, really need a genome reference. And what is a genome reference? A genome reference, you know that the, the genetic material is of course the DNA. And the composition of this of the DNA, the sequence of the nucleotides that we can represent in, in letters. Like maybe you can see here. So the sequence of those uh, nucleotides is important for us because if we have this sequence, we can uh, identify the, the genes. Okay. So you can see here that this is a, this should be like our genome reference, and about in which about two per, only two percent of the genomes are genes, but the genes are the ones that are doing the function. So they are, they are the most important. And uh, the rest is uh, what was used to, to be called the junk DNA. So it's a DNA that probably most, for most part, doesn't have any function. But it can be found between the genes. So the genes are kind of an island of functionality inside the genome. And what I wanted to show in that slide is that the wheat genome is huge and is highly repetitive. How huge it is? It's three times larger than the human genome. So this is surprising because we can't kind of think of uh, uh, genome as an indication for development, but this is not a direct link. In case of wheat, it, the genome is uh, is uh, enlarged because of what I showed you before the the hybridization between species, what we call polypolarization. And because uh, we have insert, uh, uh, proliferation of, uh, you can view of that of it as uh, DNA viruses that uh, uh, kind of spread inside our genome and causing our chromosomes. We also have it. Fifty percent of the human uh, DNA is also those DNA viruses. In the case of uh, wheat, it's eighty percent. So those viruses are, are replicating themselves and inserting themselves inside the genome, and you have a genome expansion. It complicates our effort to sequence the genome, because sequencing machines are uh, producing very short sequences, about, let's say, between 100 to 800 nucleotides, 800 letters. So imagine that you have to assemble a reference genome of 10 trillion nucleotides use, using a, a 100 nucleotide stretch. It's kind of, it's, uh, imagine it's like a, a very, uh, it's a huge puzzle that it, you have to assemble it with very small uh, parts, which most of them are repetitive, so it's kind of a blue sky, it's the same, it can go anywhere. So it was really a challenge. Um, but again, if we have, if we know the, if we know the sequence of the genome, we can then add functionality to the genes which are on top of, that are part of the genome. And for example, we can say, oh, this gene, because of we do what we call genetic mapping, this gene is responsible for the uh, spike shattering. Let's see what happened to this gene in uh, domesticated wheat. Oh, we, we can see there is a, another variation of this gene, what we call another allele of this gene. So this allele is coding uh, a non shattered spike. And that way we, we advance our knowledge of how gene function and how plants, plants evolve. So that, that is the, the logic behind that. And uh, the, the situation back at 2015 was that we had a, an international uh, consortium to sequence bread wheat, and it was uh, invested with more than $60 million. But the outcome of this um, effort was a very fragmented genome. A very fragmented genome means that maybe uh, you catch most of the gene space, most of those islands, but you cannot connect between those islands because remember there is a repetitive DNA, the junk DNA is between those islands. So all those genes are kind of floating in the, in the space and they are not in linear order. In order for geneticists to uh, use a genome reference, it has to be in a linear order. 
So starting my lab in 2010, I was kind of, uh, and this project started in 2005, I was late for the train in, in about five years. I, and most of the community was invested in, in this project. And I was counting that by 2015, I will have some uh, reference that I can work with. And that way I can uh, move ahead. But this wasn't a situation, so I uh, figured that uh, I have nothing to lose, and I should uh, do something about a, a genome reference which will be specific to wild ever wheat. By that time, I also started to work with a, a bioinformatic company, a big data company, and they understood that the challenge of assembly, assembled genomes is not for biologists. Biologists need to, what I showed you, find a function for genes. Uh, this challenge should be uh, taken care of by uh, computer programmers because it's a really a computer, pro, uh, it's a computational challenge. And they developed a software that we use later, and actually they came to this consortium with their software, asking the consortium, they, they uh, offer their services for free as a, as a proof of concept for their uh, uh, potential. And the consortium uh, politely refused this uh, uh, offer, saying that they already have their way <coughs> Of, uh, of action and they don't want to change the program. On the other hand, I know in this company I, I uh, offered them to I offered them to offer me the same deal. <laughs> <laughs> so basically give it to me for free and we'll see. Uh, because nobody nobody knew how it would work with wheat, because wheat is such a, a strange creature as I showed you. Only thing I have to take care of is the actual sequencing. What uh, actual sequencing can be done in uh, many places. There are uh, sequencing machines, and you have to you have to pay. You have to extract DNA, put it in the machine, and get the sequences back. But it, it costs some like uh, two thousand uh, two hundred thousand dollars. So not that much, but still, you know, I I have to raise this money. And the way scientists raise money is by writing proposals. And if you write a proposal, you will get reviews for this proposal. And most of, you can assume that most of the reviews will be from this consortium that they try to, try to uh, um, break the code of the Wii genome for 10 years, so all of a sudden, you know, another proposal to sequence the Wii genome, it's not really something with the high uh, chances. So what I did is I wrote uh, this letter and this is the actual email that I sent to my uh, colleagues, asking them to take part of, in this project and to contribute about $10,000, give or take. Um, surprisingly, and it's really a surprise, I found out that I have many, many uh, generous colleagues. Again, the, <laughs> the presentation is not working, but uh, I can show you later how many collaborators I had from uh, all around the world. I wanted to thank them here, but of course they are not there, so we'll continue. Uh, what you can see here, and I'm not going to go into the technicality, but this is the technicality of, of our approach, which was different, very different from the approach of the, of the other consortium. Uh, you can see here what is interesting, this is the DNA of uh, wild arrow wheat that collected from Savitan. You can see this is a huge amount of DNA, usually you don't extract so much DNA, but in this case, part of the technology is built upon the ability to uh, generate an access of genomic data, or access of sequences, 200 times larger than the genome itself. And by that, compensating for the repetitiveness of the, of the sequence. Anyway, uh, it, it is a huge data, but it started from this DNA. I think it's amazing. So imagine that you have a chromosome, eventually by using uh, the genetic map developed in my lab, uh, another approach called hi c and the software, we are able to generate something, what we call the pseudo molecule, which is very similar to uh, uh, the image of a chromosome. In this case, it, the pseudo molecule of chromosome uh, 5P was 712 million base pair long, and it was 
100 times better than any other wheat assembly. And because of that, it was um, acknowledged as a, as a press when we were able to uh, publish this uh, research in Science last summer. And you can see here that all my, my colleagues are here that, and they contributed funds and their talents in order to get it done. And, and this is not trivial. Remember, there, it was, there wasn't any uh, public funding for this project. And later on, I was able to convince the uh, Durum Wheat Sequencing Consortium to sequence also uh, Svevo using the same approach. Uh, and this is the press release. And later on, uh, also, we came back to the consortium saying, listen, you have to reconsider using the, the software. Of course, this time you will have to pay. And, but, but they took our offer because uh, you know, they, they wanted to show the state. And here I am, in Tel University here. OK. Um, but this is a, I wanted to have like a, a, a way to emphasize to you how genome reference is helping us to understand uh, biology and to uh, develop our knowledge. And you can see here that this, uh, in the sequence of the genome, this is how a gene looks like. Have you seen a gene before? Yes. Some of you, yes. So you know that I'm, I'm telling the truth, right? This is a gene. <laughs> you have the star codon, you have the stop codon, this is the coding sequence, this is the promoter region, what comes before. Uh, what this uh, protein eventually is doing, this is the coding program for a protein, what eventually is doing is responsible for the uh, shattered spike at maturity. So this trend, you remember, is something that has to do with wild and wheat. So before domestication, all, all, the, ge all the genomes of wheat, all the accession, had this functional allele. What happened after domestication? So you can see here that if we have 603 nucleotides, after domestication, in domesticated plants, what we can find is the same gene, exactly the same, but is lacking two nucleotides. So only 601 nucleotides, and the result is non-functionality of this gene, and the result is something that is beneficial for us, because it produces non-shattered spike. And non-shattered spike is something that you can conquer the world with that. Because the farmers don't need, don't need to pick the wheat spike from the ground, they can harvest, and it's uh, what we call adaptation to agricultural conditions. And and you, show, and you saw how it how it being manifested in a DNA sequence, right? It's a simple deletion of two nucleotides, but the effect is, is pretty huge. <coughs> this is a, this deletion is a, is a mutation actually. Mutation usually people are thinking mutations are very bad. In plant sciences, usually it's the opposite. We are looking for mutations. This mutation enable wheat to spread all around the world and, and, the, and for us we have easier harvest. Um, some toxicity. If I use this technology, maybe I can get rid of the toxicity and get a whole different fruit with a new flavor. Okay, this discussion, not, not now, right? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, well, we recognize this from the menu. Imagine that instead of uh, the, the marvelous wheat berry salad, we will have a wild wheat berry salad, right? This sounds much better, much better than the deletion and the mutations that I showed you before, <laughs> right? So I, you know, I said, why not? Let's, uh, let's try that. What you can see here, and I also got emails from around the world after the publication saying, "Nice that you sequence the genome. We want to taste it. We want wild and wheat. We want to, to see how it tastes." And this is a legitimate thing. So what you can see here are 2,000 grains of wild and wheat. It took my students two weeks, two students two weeks, and ten broken legs <laughs> to get this done. And the reason is that the grains of the wild and wheat are, are being uh, closed inside uh, the glooms, what we call glooms, these are the, those uh, shapes which are 
highly cellulose and very, very tough. The glumes are tough and the glumes are domesticated wheat are soft, which enable, what in, enables what we call free threshing trade. This is another domestication trait that was modified during the domestication. So, of course, this is not practical to have this uh, way of extracting grains. This is something that our ancestor did, but now we are progressed, hopefully. And uh, there is another approach. This approach is called uh, using uh, conventional, classical breeding approach, non-GMO. I can uh, take wild wheat and create what I call introgression lines. What are introgression lines? You can see the DNA of wild and wheat is represented by the black bars, the DNA of domesticated wheat by the white bars, and I can create, again, by process like Mendel did, I can create uh, genotypes that have small, relatively small fragments of the wild ember wheat genome inside domesticated wheat genome. And I can test to see what the, is the contribution of each fragment for the phenotype. In this case, what we can see here, we, we see this, a few lines that are around this area, overlapping here, that when I add a fragment from wild ember wheat, I get a slightly larger grain. Slightly larger is 5%. In the wheat world, if you think, think about 600 million tons annually, each percent is it's a huge contribution. Of course, this is, uh, still needs to be uh, translated in the field, but uh, it, show, it shows the potential of using wild wheat relatives to uh, increase yield. And what I am hoping is that we can use this collection of introgression lines also to answer the question, of what is the added value? Is there an added value of wild ember wheat to the taste and nutritional value component? So maybe in a few years, and if you invite me again, I can tell you if uh, wild ember wheat is better than domesticated wheat. If, if our ancestors uh, were, eat, were eating better than we do today. So with that, I would like to uh, thank you all and answer questions if you have.